Welcome to New York Bio's Virtual Breakfast Series, a digital program started in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode features Gay Grossman, mother, patient advocate, and co-founder of ADCY5.org. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, we will give folks a minute to join, and then we will get started. And while we're waiting for folks to join, our guest today, Gay Grossman, has a quick disclosure statement that she needs to read um, in my lawyer speak for the record. So Gay, you can go ahead and do that. Thanks, Jennifer. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanna let everybody know that while I'm here today speaking in a personal capacity as a parent of a child with a rare disease, I am the director of patient advocacy and engagement at Neurogene, a biotech company. Um, the Ideas and thoughts that I'm expressing today are mine and have nothing to do with the context and my role in Neurogene. Great, thank you. All right, all right. So I have 901, which is sort of our magic time to get started with the depth of our discussion. Um, so good morning, everybody. I am Jennifer Hawks Bland, and I'm the CEO at New York Bio. Um, as always, we're very happy that you're joining us again for an edition of our virtual breakfast series. Um, you may have noticed um, a theme um, in our conversations this month, which have been sponsored by our partner at Vertex, um, is we're talking about, um, it's Rare Disease Month, and we're talking um, with a number of patient advocates and learning more about, and in depth, more about the important work that they have been doing. Um, I don't think there is anyone more qualified to join us than Gay Grossman, and we're gonna hear about her story and her daughter Lily's story um, as we go through the conversation. Um, with, oh, I almost always forget to do this. I should just hold up a little placard. If you have <laughs> questions during the chat um, that we have with Gay today, please ask them in either the Q&A box or the chat feature. And as we go through our conversation, Derek and I will um, get to those questions in the in due course. Um, so please put your questions in. Um, I know you have some, we look forward to them. And with that, I will turn it over to Derek to kick off our conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer. So Gay, good morning, good early morning. Thank you so much. We, uh, we always give a little extra thank you to our West Coast guests for getting up with the sunrise for us. Uh, also a quick shout out to Matt Burkhart who introduced us to you, Matt is terrific. So, um, we are really thrilled to have you here today. And I think one of the things that is incredibly important is that we recognize that there are broader contributions to, uh, to patient health, to the patient experience, and there's more people in the equation. And you represent one of those people, which is a caregiver, a uh, mother of a daughter with a rare disease. So as we kind of get started, why don't you give us a little bit of a background, tell us about Lily and tell us a little bit about your experiences. Thanks, Derek. Um, so uh, my daughter was born a um, healthy, typical little girl in 1997. So she is 25 years old now. Um, pretty soon after she was born, she was probably eight months when I first have it on record that there was a question that I had asked a doctor about her ability to sit up. And um, she was a very good roller and um, you know, there were a lot of things that were that were typical about her, but there were th some things that that were not. Um, she was not pulling up in her crib. Um, if you would sit her down on her bottom, she would kind of in a controlled way roll back to her back and her fine motor skills were OK, but um, she just didn't seem to be progressing the same way that others in the play group were. So I started asking questions and, um, you know, was quickly met with things like, you know, this must be your first child and, you know, stop comparing her to other people. And, and um, you know, I still just kind of had this thing knocking at the back of my head that things weren't quite right. So I began asking questions um, and things that they did, like the Denver study is the first thing that, that they do is kind of a checklist. And one of the things that they really measure against your abilities as a child um, is your eating skills. And if you can swallow correctly, then, then things, a lot of things are, are eliminated. Um, but there's a lot of wait and see. And, and I, I, wanted, I do want to say that, you know, remember my story is, is now 25 years old. So things that are happening in the pediatrician's office now are probably and hopefully different than they were when I was experiencing. But um, we did go through quite a 
laundry list of um, not only doctors, but also institutions. We were living in Cleveland, Ohio, so we had some very, very good health care there. Um, we quickly made it to places like Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, Cleveland Clinic, and um, no one could really decide what what was going on and time was passing and um, very quickly she was all of a sudden two years old and still not walking. Um, other things were typical she could crawl and and um, you know she had pulled up a few times on things so she had it there but we really didn't know what it was but um, we went through a, a very long time of trying to figure out what was what was wrong and getting a lot of good and normal test results. Um, there's a there's a notebook that I have that is, you know, tabbed by date and by test, and it's a very thick notebook. And I can say, how thick is this binder, right? Yeah, and every test in it is normal. So, um, you know, as I said, time went on, and uh, there was definitely something not right. She started using a walker, and and um, we started physical therapy and occupational therapy and swimming and. Our days were very much full of, of therapies and doctor's appointments, but still having no diagnosis. Um, that went on for you know a long time. She was misdiagnosed with cerebral palsy, which is very common. Um, that diagnosis is actually very helpful to parents because you get a lot of therapies and insurance can cover things when you have a diagnosis like that. But I also knew enough and was reading enough to know that her MRI was normal. And if her MRI was normal, then she didn't have cerebral palsy. So we kept looking for a diagnosis. And um, when she got to be about uh, six years old, life with a wheelchair and a walker in Cleveland, Ohio can be a little difficult. <laughs> it's yes. cold and mm -hmm. um, holding onto a walker with little hands with no mittens, um, yeah. you know, it's not any fun. So we decided that we needed to open ourselves up to some more opportunities. And that included um, one moving to a place that was more comfortable. Um, the, the, I would say most challenging symptom that my daughter endured was being up all night. She developed these tremors over time where they were, um, they looked like full blown seizures and this would go on all night long. And as she got older and her body got bigger, they got more severe and they got longer. So we um, got to a point where she was getting up, um, you know, 20 times a night. And, um, you know, it was, it was obviously exhausting to all three of us. We took shifts. People ask me that all the time. How did you get through so many years of not sleeping at night? And um, I would go to bed first for a few hours. My husband would be with her and then we would switch and I would be up with her and, um, you know, I was working for myself so I could really coordinate my work schedule kind of around this. I, I, I still don't know how Willie got up every day and went to school, but she did. And, um, you know, we just kind of made it work and you just kind of go day by day and night by night. And um, when I look back at it now and when we go through one of those crisis times, I do wonder how I did it because it's it's exhausting. I'm obviously older now too, but um, it's a, it was a difficult time. Anyway, we, we changed our world completely. We moved to San Diego, California when she was, we made the decision when she was six, it took us about a year to coordinate our personal lives and move here. Um, we were both self-employed at that time. So we moved our businesses here and um, we quickly became entrenched in people that were in the biotech field. Um, we were able to get a diagnosis through a study through whole genome sequencing when she was 15. But from the time she was, you know, about one until she was 15, we did not know what, what the challenge was. And really we weren't at that point in science. We didn't have it yet. Right. I knew about whole genome sequencing. I was asking about it. You know, we even, we even went back for a muscle biopsy when she was in seventh grade, when she started to decline a little bit. And I asked again, you know, and the, and the response I got was, you know, it's still a half a million dollars and we don't know what we do with the information anyway. And, you know, we'll just keep an eye on it and things will change. And um, she was the first one diagnosed here in San Diego at Scripps uh, and was able to get a diagnosis that her uh, ADCY5 and DOC3 genes were um, affected and, um, ADCY5 seemed to be the one that was really the gear on the bike. And so that's where we focused our attention. 
And also because uh, she and I share that mutation on the DOC3 gene. And because I don't have any symptoms, um, we felt that it was better to focus on the other, which has yeah. been to our benefit. So that's kind of the, um, the short story of a very long time of trying to figure out what was wrong. Okay, did, when you said that she was basically right misdiagnosed, right, with cerebral palsy. And did they... Did they diagnose her with something else once they realized it really wasn't cerebral palsy or because I know that's a it's a common theme right it's you find a diagnosis and then they realize that doesn't really fit right so then they try something else and in your case clearly it was until she was sequenced but how did that process play out yeah so in between there when it probably wasn't cerebral palsy um, then we had a diagnosis of mitochondrial disease but our actual diagnosis was undiagnosed mitochondrial disease right so I actually had one specialist here in San Diego telling me um, it's not a mitochondrial disease and then we still had our specialist at the Cleveland Clinic that would say it is a mitochondrial disease we just don't know which one it is so you know really at this time we were all of us were learning about all these different diseases yeah. and so many things fall under mitochondrial disease and it is a mitochondrial disease. It's just, you know, this is brand new. She was the first one in the world diagnosed with the full body presentation of this disease. So just to be clear and to give a little more context where, you know, this, this quote unquote diagnostic journey, right? This was 15 years. Mm -hmm. Right. This was not, you know, it, it, the, the amount of time it takes to tell the story is, is a few minutes, but just for kind of the edification of the audience, this is like week in and week out for 15 years. And I mean, is it, was it constant? I mean, were you back and forth? Was it basically nonstop 15 years on the phone with doctors or mm -hmm. was there some level of, well, we're not sure we have to, you know, we have to get up in the morning tomorrow anyway we'll go and we'll see if anything comes different. What is, what's the spacing like that? How heavy does that cloud lay over you every single day? Or are there like spurts of we're doing something new with a new doctor now? Well, we were trying to obviously alleviate the symptom of her not sleeping because that was the most difficult yeah. one. Um, you know, we, we've since started studies and a lot of researchers will say, oh, we're really trying to get these kids out of a wheelchair. And, and I'll think that's not the worst thing. Yeah, you know, right. the worst thing is not being able to sleep all night. Um, but Derek, to answer your question, it, it was constant. I mean, when you're up all night, you're definitely thinking every night, like, what am I not doing? What if what right. what stone have we not uncovered? And the other thing that you're thinking the whole time is like, what are we doing that could be actually hurting her and making right. this worse? Because we were playing with her diet. We were giving her certain medications to try to dull the movements. Um, we were, we were doing all kinds of things, you know, like is the pool I'm taking to her for, through, you know, for therapy, is there something in the pool that's affecting her? Mm -hmm. Is, is there something in our house that we're doing? Like, is there some cleaning agent I'm using? Like we actually had someone come into our house and look at every single thing in our house to see if perhaps like, are we burning fires with a log that is somehow affecting her? We had no right. candles in our house. We had no fires in our house for years because we, we had no idea what could be affecting her. And, and certain things did and do affect her that you wouldn't think. Um, but yeah, it's a, it was a daily thing. And we were putting her through every test you can imagine. And we, by the time she was eight years old, we had taken her to 45 specialists. We were taking her all over the place. We had been to every every institution you can think of. We have been there. Yep. No, it's 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 massive, and you know, it's. I don't want to think about you know the whole light at the end of the tunnel thing, but you you kind of it seems like you have several different problems that you're working on at once, all of which have no clear answer, which you know I can only imagine both. You know, there's there's massive amounts of frustration, but they're you know compounded by the fact that you're working you're working diligently for somebody else, just trying to make everything better. So you're frustrated that you don't have answers, and then you have to now watch the person that you're working for not getting any better. So I imagine, you know, and, and sorry to ask it like this, but how much of it is how much do you internalize? Like, what am I not doing right? Right, because that's constantly something I think about as a parent, right? Yeah. But you know, no, I, how, how much of it do you put on yourself? You know, the, the um, I think the only thing that helped me go to bed at night was if I had done one thing a day to help her. Yeah. 
and it would be, um, you know, like, did I make sure that she had the therapy that she needed? You know, there was constant right. insurance battles through the whole thing. And so if I could make sure that at least I had her care for that day set up in the best way and her school was set up in the best way so that she was feeling some kind of sort of success and achievement in her life, mm -hmm. then I felt that I was doing what I could for her as a parent. But, um, you know, I, I have spoken like this in, in to different people since she was probably in about sixth grade was the first time I was asked to speak. And I, the, the topic was about, you know, how have you accommodated schools so that your daughter could be in a typical school? And I used to speak about that to other families um, so that they could understand the accommodations that we made because they were heavy. Um, she graduated from high school on time. She graduated from college on time. And, and this was not like just sign her up and send her in. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what the conversation started. And then it was, you know, how did you get the diagnosis? And then it was, how did you change your life? And how did her life change because of the diagnosis? And um, just a few years ago, I was asked for the first time to talk about the perspective from me as a mother. And I will tell you that that was the most difficult talk I've ever given. Um, I read that talk for 35 days out loud every single day, and it took me that long to not cry through it. And it was the first time that I had actually stopped enough to take a look back at what I had gone through as a parent. I think it's important to note, and I never really realized this until I wrote that talk, that in all of those years, I never had one of Lily's doctors ask me how I was doing. And if you think about what young mothers are going through, like to me, that is really, really a missed, it's, a, it's really a missed opportunity to help the family. This is extremely yeah. stressful on families. You know, there, I don't know many families who are still together after yeah. going through something like this. And the support that a family gets is not enough. So, no. talk, I, so ahead, I, I don't wanna to shift totally, but talk to us a little bit about the work you've done in creating adcy5.org and how your focus is is on the patients but it's also on the caregivers as well well so we started adcy5.org um, in 2015 and the reason that we started it was um, lily was presented at a very large conference um, at the movement disorder congress and it was here in san diego um, they had one of these kind of, you know, stump the chump kind of things where they had a physician on stage and Lily and I were on stage and they gave a little background on her and, and the physician was able to ask me questions, I think for two minutes and then people had to guess what her diagnosis was. Well, of course, nobody knew what it was. Yeah, right. And then Lily's neurologist got up and she explained and she shared Lily's test results. She shared her history. And, um, and so the day after that, it was a Saturday and our neurologist called us and she said, I need to talk to you both right now. And she came to our home and she said, um, people are coming out of the woodwork. You have got to start a website. Yeah. We've got to give a place for people to go. And um, we, we um, said goodbye to her. And within three hours, we had a website up and we were um, having clinicians ask us questions. We were having families call us. We now have people call us within, you know, hours of getting a diagnosis. And, yeah. and really the goal there was, and we always knew the goal was when, when Lily was diagnosed, we always knew we had to have a hundred patients at least. And right. so that became our next feat was we've got to find these people. And we were very fortunate that there was a lot of press done around her being the first one sequenced at Scripps right. um, and diagnosed that we knew that we had a little bit of a PR train that we could ride on. Yep. And so anytime we agreed to a story, we, we gave um, you know, two stipulations to that. We said, you have to put the name of the gene in the article and you have to put our website. And so we were able to find, you know, now we have over 300 patients and um, people are diagnosed all the time. We had two more patients last week. So it's, and it's all ages. It's, it's babies that are being diagnosed very early. They're about a year, year and a half when they start to show symptoms or when families actually get to genetic testing. And then we also have people who are in their sixties who have had a different diagnosis their whole life. And, you know, they just stop because they have a diagnosis and they think, well, this is my diagnosis and, you know, I need to 
just kind of accommodate my world around this. So um, we started the foundation and, um, you know, my husband and I have both been in sales, so we're pretty good at networking and we bring people together and people, um, you know, we're pretty good at uncovering things and we were able to find people who were already working on the gene. And um, we have done a lot to bring the sciences and researchers together and to um, get a lot of science to be done. We have, you know, stem cells and we have natural history studies going and we're still at the point of learning a lot about the disease, but we have been able to make significant progress and change Lily and other kids' lives significantly. So I'd like to ask you about uh, genetic testing just just broadly, because obviously the, the genetics and genomics industry has come incredibly far in, in the last 20 years, right? The cost of sequencing is going down. There's so many uh, more things we can do, especially now with more analytical power. So can you talk a little bit about what it was like for you to get into a study at Scripps with Eric Topol and what it's like for families now to try and get their kids uh, sequenced, right? So if, if there's any families now that are wondering what to do and wondering how to do it and who, don't, who may not know much about uh, genetic sequencing, how does somebody do that now and what does it look like? Well, it, unfortunately, it's not as easy as you think it would be. You know, there's still that step care approach where you know let's let's test this first, and 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 you right. kind of go through the sequence of of getting sequence is the wrong word to use in this context, but you go through these yeah. steps of getting right. tests, and you have to unfortunately go through a lot of them to actually get to genetic testing, and so we haven't changed that yet today. Um, and I think the other challenge is that physicians who are seeing these families are you know, there's a lot of information thrown at them and they don't have a lot of time, you know, just like yeah. a, as a parent, I have the insurance companies rattling me, they, they're they rattling the clinicians too. And, and yeah. it makes things really difficult for the patient in the end. And, um, you know, we have it on our website of how to print out a form and go into your clinician and ask for it. But, you know, it's, it's really putting it all on the parents. And, yeah when I think about the things that we had to do and the things that, um, whether it was in medicine or education, it really was on us as parents to make sure that we pushed things through to get where we needed her to be. So I think that still happens today. I think that the genetic testing, it, you really have to push to make sure that you're getting all the testing. And it's very confusing the way it's set up. You know, We have all these panels that are available and you know, some panels have one thing and some have another. And how are clinicians right. really supposed to keep up with this? Right. Well, and your clinician is, is in general, A, not a genetic counselor and B, you know, right. may or may not be up to speed on genomics, right? I mean, if you're, right. you know, if you're worried about, you know, if you're worried about panels, you know, what is the cost of whole genome sequencing and all of, and all of these things, you know, what is, it sounds like we're at a point where, a kind of more comprehensive solution where we thought about how are we getting to the answers that we need and how do we actually get answers to patients and parents earlier is more important than you know any step of maybe we run this panel first because really you know and, and just extrapolating from what you said before another maybe doesn't help right you know maybe it's a different gene yeah. maybe it's a gene no one has heard of before yeah and you know what not a lot of um you know, I don't, I didn't make a lot of friends in this process when it came to clinicians, <laughs> you know, I, I was the one who had the note on the door that said, you know, I don't really care if you have my daughter as an assignment and you have to present her at Cran Rounds. Like if the door's not open, that means she's not awake. Like, do not come in here. Not, yes. yes. Of all so, things, um, do not wake her up. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes, there were, there were some not nice things said a lot of times when I was in a hospital with a, with a doctor, but it's, you're really at your wits end. I mean, you're yeah. exhausted. You're trying to take care of a child that is really not doing well. And, you know, Lily was at that point, she was not walking. So I'm carrying her everywhere if she's not in a wheelchair and lifting yeah. her back and forth. And, and um, you know, for then someone to come in and say, well, I need to take her temperature because I've got a presenter at Grand Rounds doesn't really sit well. <laughs> so, you you know, I was really pushy and, and um, 
I was pushy with her in school. And, you know, my friends say that in, in any time she graduated from one of the schools or we moved from Ohio to California, you know, the, all my friends were like, you know, there's a big party right now because everybody's so happy from the school you're leaving. But, um, uh, you know, I think that put, it just puts so much on parents to be like that. And you have to, yeah. you know, I don't want to say be nasty, but it's, it gets so that you really have to be so aggressive that to get your kid the testing they need, it's so unfortunate. And I think some of it's changing, but you really have to have somebody be your quarterback. And if you don't have someone who's willing to do the testing, you have to move on and find somebody who is. Yep. I mean, that's why she'd seen so many doctors by the time she was eight. It wasn't because they were all different specialists. You know, yeah. this was because I was changing. If you didn't do the tests that I felt were needed, then I went to somebody else where I could get it. Right. How would you advise, and I'm just thinking, so obviously you lived in Cleveland, right? So you had access to excellent, in, in general, right? Excellent medical care. Right. We live in New York, so we have world-class medical centers here. Um, for the, you know, the families that are struggling to figure out what's going on with their children that are in a rural area and maybe have a pediatrician in a community hospital, like right. what process did those parents need to start thinking about for their children? in order to find answers? Well, a lot of them travel. And if they can't travel, then I, you know, they get on the phone. I mean, I'll give you an example of what I did when Lily was a baby. I, um, you know, this is, this is going back to when we were all pretty new to computers, right? And I remember getting online and <clears throat> I knew that Lily had newborn screening. And so I got online and figured out which, which state did the greatest amount of tests on their panel. Right. And I called that state and I got a kit and I had it mailed to me in Ohio. And then, you know, there I was sitting there, like I didn't have a doctor to write a script, to go get a blood draw. Right. So I had gone to this lab so many times that I knew the nurse and I went in there and I said, tell me where I can get a prescription to get this test done. And um, I explained to her why I was doing it. I said, you know, everything's coming back negative and this test tests more than any other test than I can get my hands on. And so she basically drew the blood, put it in the tube, pushed me out the back door, and I put it in the mailbox as I went home. And she just like, I don't know how to build this. So you're just going to go out the back door and we're just going to get this yeah. done because I, we all want to find out what's wrong with her. So, um, you know, not everybody's that resourceful to like get on the phone and figure something like that out. But I think a lot of families have to do that. And that's one of the one of the faults of our system is that people who are in these rural areas are not able to get the care that they need for their child. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of that is what comes in with our foundation is when we get calls from families and they say, we've read your stories about the other kids and they sound, sound so much like my kid, how can I get tested? And then we work with them to make sure that they can get a test or they can get a doctor, at least on the phone. And that's one of the things that this pandemic has helped us with is that you know now I can get my neurologist on the phone with a family in China who right. can't get the help they need uh, and you know just talk to them about what they can do from where they are and, and what area they're from. So um, you know it's possible, but it, it takes a lot to get a family there. It takes, it's too much for a family to get there. Right. Yeah, you, for, every, for, every fam, for every family like you that actually was you know, I'll use the word fortunate here just on a statistical basis, but fortunate enough to have events happen in the right way where you got to an answer. There are many, many families that haven't. And, you know, now with the way that you work in the organization, you are, you're giving people a lot of the opportunities and information that you had to work really, really hard to find, right? So can you give us just an overview of, because ADCY5 org does a lot of different things you've you've funded research you you help people in a lot of different ways you actually help people that have themselves found uh that they have this mutation can you j just give us an overview of i guess all of the different things that the organization does everything <laughs> well, well get, we don't have that maybe a, long, maybe a okay. small <laughs> menu a smaller menu well, first, you know, first and foremost, we're there for patients who um, and families who get a diagnosis and they really have nowhere to go. You know, they don't yeah. understand. And um, right now we're spending a lot of time on the new treatment that has been found in the past few years. Um, and it's a lot of education around that. So 
Um, a lot of clinicians are reluctant to raise doses and figure out how to, how to dose the, the treatment. And so we connect them with our researchers so that they can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and they can actually work through, the, through it with the families and, and get, the, um, get the treatment that they, that they need. Um, so that a lot of time is spent there. And then we do coordinate the research and we work with young researchers and experienced researchers. So mm -hmm. we're very interested in researchers that are new and interested in movement disorders. Um, there are also some researchers that started working on the disease and for whatever reason lost funding and they've kind of put it in a drawer. We try to get either that research to that research to the researchers now who are working on it, or we fund that young researcher so that they can take it where they want it to go. But we bring the researchers together so that they can have conversations with one another, share what they've learned. Um, just recently, I made a trip to Arizona to meet a researcher who was interested in doing a study, and he was applying for a grant, and he wanted us to write a letter of support which is great and, and we're happy to do, but I wanna learn about what your grant is for. Yeah, right. And we were fortunate enough to learn that what he was applying for was something that we were already doing and we were already funding. And so we were able to put him together with a researcher um, and say, you know, this is, this is the person who's done it, what you're interested in, like let's use your grant for something different to get us to right. the next step. Yeah. So it's just making sure that we're in touch with a lot of the, with all the people that are doing the research and we can take them, to, you know, put them together and make sure that there's no overlap and that people yeah. are learning from each other. Right. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned a treatment uh, before. So can you talk a little bit about how you came to find a, a treatment and what the treatment does? Because it's, it's not like you've stumbled upon a cure uh, and there's no. still more work to be done, but, but talk a little bit about the journey to actually get to a treatment and, and really how that's helped. Yeah, was our, one of our, our lead researcher actually um, had come up with this. He's in Europe and um, it actually was a little bit by mistake, but then he noticed that this, this child was having, having a benefit because of drinking coffee. And um, so we started doing research on it and our foundation actually funds the mice that he works with to, to further the knowledge about caffeine. Um, but what they found was that caffeine um, works on the overexpressed gene. ADCY5 is a gain of function and caffeine works in the opposite way. It's, it's a little bit like Ritalin would work for ADHD. Right. Okay. So um, actually when Lily was in college, he had brought this up to us that he had started studying this and um, he really thought that we should try it with Lily. And at this point in time, she was probably getting up you know, 10 to 12 times a night, which, which sounds horrible, but that's kind of like where our good place was. And, um, we could, you know, we even said to Lily, like, you know, he says we should try this. And she's like, yeah, but I can deal with where I am now. And I just want to get through school. And if we make a change like that, it's very common that she would end up in the hospital and we kind of go through this rigmarole and it would take about a month to get her on track. And she said, you know, I don't have that time. And if I do that and I lose a month, I won't graduate on time. So she managed with that getting up, you know, eight to 10 to 12 times a night. So um, when she graduated, the stress brings the movements on harder and more frequently. So by the time we went to graduation for college, she was really not doing well at all. She was um, using her power chair. She could not drive her power chair. She was, um, she was up all night and uh, it was just a really bad time. And we brought her home after the graduation. And my husband said, you know, I want to try the caffeine. And I said, you know, I'm at a loss. I don't know what to do. Things are not working. Do whatever you want to do. So we got on the phone with the researcher and our neurologist and we set out a plan and we gave her the first caffeine capsule. And within a day, um, we could see a difference. And she could feel a difference. And so then we went from, you know, just that one capsule to figuring out how do we dose this throughout the day? And, um, you know, how do we, how do we incorporate this into her, her life? Cause you know, she was taking a lot of medications. Right. So it's probably, this is probably a good time to show that first slide. Yeah, sure. So, um, the difference that we've been able to see and the slide that Derek's bringing up is a 10 year difference. And um, it shows you the before and after of caffeine. So on the left hand side is um, 
in 2011. And you can see that uh, Lily could not hold her head up on her own. She was in a reclined wheelchair. The, the seat that she's sitting in is custom molded to you know, her bottom and also her back. It's one of the most involved and expensive manual wheelchairs you can buy because of all of the, the features that it has on it. You can see that um, her shoulders are strapped back because she would fall forward. She has clips on the bottom of her feet because her feet would kick forward and she has armrests and she's not able to move that chair on her own because she just didn't have the ability to do it. I was constantly leaning over that chair and putting her hands back up on her lap because they would just fall off. And um, she just was completely dependent on us physically. And then the picture uh, in 2021, and this is after she has been on the caffeine for about a year. Um, or actually it's more than that. It's, it's um, gosh, the pandemic makes everything just evaporate, right? <laughs> so she started the caffeine in 2019 and this is 21. So you can see her wheelchair there and that black behind her head is actually a doorknob. It's not a headrest. So her headrest is gone. She's sitting in a 90 degree angle chair. The seat and back are not custom for her. There no, there's nothing on her feet holding her feet in place. She has no armrests. She can move the chair by herself. Um, she can get in and out of that wheelchair by herself. So she can put the brakes on by herself. She can pull herself forward into a standing position and get herself onto a sofa. Um, her speech is completely different. She can, you can ask her a question and she answers you on cue. Um, she is able to be understood by people who don't know her for the first time. Uh, I even had a phone call with her recently because she had a question on one of her visa bills. And so sometimes I get on the phone with her just to kind of walk through, um, you know, how we make these phone calls as a, as a kid out of college and yes. kind of doing your own financing. Yes. I just say, um, I get on the phone with her and I, the guy on the other end says, you know, what's the credit card number that we're talking about? And I thought, oh, geez, I don't have her credit card number in front of me. And Lily just rattles off the 16 digits and the guy understands her the first time. And so, you know, there, these are big differences. And um, the, the one thing that I really want to point out is that, you know, no, we haven't cured anybody. She still has this disease. She still has significant needs because of this disease. She needs 24 seven care. Um, she does need to have someone, you know, cook her food and help her get dressed. And um, yeah. she's recently been able to dress herself uh, you know, from start to finish, which is uh, unbelievable. If someone had told me she'd be able to do that, I would not have believed that, but she did that over Christmas when she was home. So as she start, as she's doing things and moving more, she's getting stronger. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this is a huge achievement. And I think so many families get into the world of rare disease. And the first thing they think of is I have to cure this disease. I have to, you know, completely eliminate this from my child's life. And you know, I've been in this long enough to know that sometimes that is not the, um, that's not what's going to happen. You know, if rare disease is a, is a very complicated unknown, um, we are learning so much, but there is so much more to be learned and to have changes like this in our lives. And Lily now sleeps all night long with no tremors. Um, it's, Life changing, you know, something like this is. Um, I'm I'm good with this. Like I know I still have a wheelchair in my house, right. but it's a lot smaller and it's a lot less prominent in our world. And, um, you know, Lily's happy, and she was happy with her first treatment when the when the sleeping got a little bit better, um, but this is this has really made a huge difference in our lives and it's making a difference in children's lives who are very very young so um i just i think it's important for families to understand that that the home run isn't the only thing that will make a difference in your life and gay what what um and we actually had a question from the audience and i kind of had the same question too how do you figure out what amount of caffeine is appropriate, right? To, yeah, to so we worked really closely with the researcher, obviously, who, who studies this on the mice. Yeah. And, you know, it has a short half-life. So you have to give yeah. it continually. Um, 
Lily does take it four times a day. And people are always amazed when I tell them that she does take it right before she goes to bed. Right. And um, it is, you know, if you give it to her, you actually just see her whole body just kind of like calm. It takes about, it takes about 20 minutes. And um, she definitely, there's definitely a difference if she doesn't have it with her and she, she knows when she needs it. And she'll say, you know, I need my caffeine. And, and she takes it before she gets out of bed in the morning. And she'll wait about 15 minutes before she gets up to use the restroom, because then she knows that she'll have, she'll have more coordination and things are just connecting better. Right. Um, but we have families and clinicians work with the researcher to make sure that they get the dose they need. I would say that the biggest error that we have in our community is not using enough of it. And, um, and, you know, obviously it's, I, I don't even share how much Lily takes because I don't want people to go on the dosing that we use. You know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a healthcare yeah. professional, and you really need to work with your clinician to make sure that you get the right dose. But, you know, we are right now doing a, um, we just finished a round of focus groups with one of our researchers who's writing up about how to care for someone and give guidance on care for, for this disease. And I'm excited to have that because, um, you know, I can refer to other people in order to get help on how to do this, but, but certainly I'm, I'm not the person to, to guide people on that. And then so, we also, oh, go, go ahead. ahead, Jennifer, go ahead. No, 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 you go. That's, that's oh, okay. Sure that. And then um, we had another question from the audience and it, it was asking about um, treatments, which we've just talked about. And then the question is now that you've learned like about, a, you know, a treatment, Mm -hmm. um, what are things that you can do different or better to help other patients? And then are you, is the community also looking at other things like gene therapy as a more, you know, long-term solution? Um, you know, gene therapy is a fabulous thing that we're all learning about, right? And there are lots of treatments coming down the road, but um, for ADCY5, our gene is too big to fit in AAV9, the capsule that is, is so popular right now. So we're learning a lot about different genes and, um, you know, we're definitely talking to people about it, but it's not what is going to help the community with ADCY5 related dyskinesia. Not right now, not today. Right. So and, you would say, go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, I was just gonna say, and what, you know, one thing that we talked about earlier, which I think probably bears, you know, drilling down on a little bit is what we've talked about and in, in, in talking with other parents and caregivers, right, of children with diseases that are undiagnosed or misdiagnosed, it's often the quality of life rather than the cure, like you were talking about earlier. Yeah. And um, are you all seeing that caffeine is having that impact of quality of life across the um, sort of the universe of patients that have been diagnosed with ADC5? Yeah, so ADCY5 related dyskinesia is um, it's seen and exhibits differently in patients across the community. So um, different people have you know different needs. There there are some people who can drive a car and who run, um, but they're affected differently. So it just depends on what their symptoms are, and um, you know they just have to coordinate with their doctor to figure out you know, what works. But one of the other changes that we were able to make with Lily is to, to have her stop taking certain drugs. So a lot of the medications, and this was actually before the caffeine, this is when she was sequenced and we found out what the diagnosis was. We were able to change a lot of her medications. And, you know, that's why I'm such a proponent of genetic testing is, you know, we were trying to dull these movements with a lot of seizure medications, which can also dull you. Right. And, um, she was, you know, kind of foggy in, in uh, high school. And she will say that she'll say, I don't, re I didn't realize like how foggy I was. And, and even after the caffeine and we were able to decrease, maybe not get rid of certain things, but yeah. she does take other medications. She just has a little bit brighter look in her eyes. You know, she's, yeah. um, she took some medications that really dull you and, um, and we've been able to get rid of or lessen a most of those. Right. You mentioned something before that I wanted to come back to you because I think it's probably counter to what people who haven't gone through, you've gone through experience. And you talked about the, basically the decision to not switch anything, you know, the month or so before Lily graduated high school. And 
the list of reasons had much more to do with what does my life look like when I try something new rather than we should try something new because it has some some hope attached to it, right? And I think people probably don't appreciate that part of everything about all of the different whys that go into why do you do something differently and what is what does timing look like, right? There's a whole other element mm-hmm. of, you know, how is this going to affect our lives and what if it doesn't do what we think it might do, right? You know, if yeah. it's increased number of hospital visits or whatever, and, you know, to the uninitiated, it's, well, you tried a new therapy to, you know, someone in your position is like, well, this is a three month process where instead of living the way that we normally do, we went to the hospital six times and, you know, mm-hmm. it took six weeks of those three months. Yeah. I mean, obviously, well, not obviously, but we've spent a lot of time in hospitals and usually it's a, it's, you know, on average, it's a 10 day stay. And so it's a, you know, we have to weigh that a lot. And Lily was going to college about an hour and a half away from us. And so when that last month was coming around and she was finishing papers and, and she was trying to wrap up and, you know, her goal was to walk through that graduation ceremony and she knew exactly what needed to happen for that to, to come about. So, um, she is a very persistent and uh, goal oriented young woman. And I leave those decisions a lot up to her. And um, when she, you know, she knew she's on calls with our community and she's on calls with our researchers and, and um, she's cognitively typical. So she understands exactly where she is and, and, um, and what she needs to do to get where she wants to be. So when I said to her, you know, she knew about this and she just said, I don't want to try it right now. It's, It's too much of a risk. And, um, she could deal with what she was living with at that time. And I do think you have to kind of weigh that back and forth. And, you know, as different treatments come up for her, um, she does have to weigh that. And, and I really leave those conversations up to her and, and I have her come to me to ask the questions and, you know, we're there in part of the conversation, but, you know, we have some of that going on right now. There's, um, we have some things that we hope will come to fruition and, and uh, she'll be the one to decide whether she does it or not. You know, I, I do say, of course, I don't speak for her. And if you want to show the next slide, people um, often want to know, like, where is she today? So this was um, taken with her um, on her birthday, which was just Saturday. And, um, you know, every birthday is is momentous for us as a family. It's also very sad as a family because, you know, it, it, if someone had said to me at 25, she still won't be walking on her own. Um that would be hard to hear as a young mother and birthdays are hard. Holidays are hard. Every um, holiday marks a time where we haven't gotten where we thought we might be, or, um, you know, things aren't happening as fast as we want them to happen. But, um, you know, we've come a long way. And as you can see, she actually started these pictures sitting in her wheelchair and, um, she said to me, you know, I want to try to take a picture, not sitting in my wheelchair. And I said, okay, well, you can see we're under construction in my house. This is the last room to get done. (laughs) She wanted to sit on this, this new mantle. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, and I always want to set her up for success, right? I don't want to just like have her fall over. And, and so I said, okay. And and she said, I, you know, I said, where do you want to sit? And she said, I want to sit right there in the mantle. And I thought, okay. So she said, I just need something, you know, softer. So I went and got the blanket that she's sitting on and, um, and she, you know, got herself there and and she sat down and she said, wow, this is the perfect height. And I think I can sit here by myself. And I said, okay. And you can see she's wearing boots with heels on them. Like, you know, she's always got to look just so (laughs) to to fit as part (laughs) of But, you know, I'm, I'm staying there really closely and she's like, you know, go take the picture. And I had to actually go pretty far away to get the full picture. And, and I was a little nervous about leaving her there, but, um, but she was completely fine. And you can see that her hands are even relaxed and, and she was able to sit there. And, I, and as I took the picture, I thought, you know, usually this is a really a, a difficult day for me um, with her birthday, but it was such a happy moment for me that she was actually able to sit that way. Like my, my most unfavorite day every year of her growing up was school picture day. That was a very difficult day for me because, you know, the guy shows up and he's got his like little round stool. That's like sitting up high. And, um, you know, there are just so many things that are challenging about having a child with, with a disability, but 
um, Saturday was a good day with, with this picture. And, and um, I did get her okay to use this. She knows, she always knows when I'm speaking and who I'm speaking to and what we're talking about, because, you know, she is an adult, this is her world. And I'm, you know, obviously speaking as her mom. So obviously one of the things that I, that I think is, is, you know, interesting and really fortunate in this situation is obviously Lily's relationship with you and with the outside community has changed over the course of her life. So what were some of the big, what were kind of some of the big landmark times where she kind of grew into that a little bit more? And how did you, how did you deal with that really? Because you, you went from really the only source of, you know, any sort of back and forth information or anything to then have to, you know, take in her opinion and have her be more involved with it. What was that process like? Well, she's really become her own advocate, you know, for a lot of things. Um, she needs to coordinate a staff of people who would take care of her. Um, she's required to interview them and she has to let them go when they don't work out. So she is, you know, she's an adult and has had to grow up a lot more than, more than other kids. When I compare her to some of my girlfriend's kids, um, She's much more independent, even though she can't be independent. She is completely independent with her finances. And, you know, like I said, hiring people, um, you know, planning her meals and grocery shopping and, and doing a lot of things that a lot of kids, I think her age aren't doing. So what are some of the things that you talk to, um, the mothers and the parents about that, that reach out to you? What are some of some of the the major things that, you know, almost like your top three things that you, that you tell people the first time that they call you, right? Because I imagine you find a lot of people in a lot of similar situations. Oh, it's identical. You know, we've all gone through the, the challenges of trying to find a diagnosis. It's just lost time now, you Mm -hmm. know, which is, which is fabulous. But I think that the most important thing that I try to instill in them is that this is really hard and I understand it's hard and I am, am, have gone through it and am going through it and that we are there to help them. And that, you know, this is not something that they should um, think that is, they're going to be able to manage easily. Like I'm very honest with families to let them know that um, there are resources, but this is not easy. Yeah. yeah, I think there's, it, it, it's, you know, not, not that it's equivalent, but I've had this conversation with entrepreneurs in, in a lot of ways where you have people that the, the people that are positive with you all the time are not terribly helpful. It doesn't, it doesn't buy you anything. It doesn't really give you anything, right? It's basically carbohydrates in a conversation, right? It's kind of nice, but it doesn't really do all that much for you. Um, and yeah, it's I harder if, to have the conversations that matter. I think if I can give families tangible things to walk away with to do to make their day better and just say to them they've just got to take it day by day and and that's kind of what it is you really have to move day by day because if you try to look ahead too far it's very overwhelming yeah we we actually had a question from the audience which i also think fits here we're talking about tangible things for parents the question was around um are there is therapy and I'm going to slightly change it, covered for parents and caregivers as part of the diagnosis. And then how do you, so along that coverage question, how do you talk to parents and sort of get them prepared for dealing with insurance and what you're going to have to deal with as far as coverage of treatments and care? Um, So it's an ongoing thing. Um, I I have a legal pad on my desk and a a book every day that... um, like this book is right here. I, I always have a book and that goes by day of my notes of what happens with every conversation that I have. And it's a small book because I carry it with me. So anywhere I yeah. go, that book is with me. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's kind of a game of seeing who can keep, keep better notes. Is it you or the insurance company and how well do you know your certificate of benefits? And, um, you know, fighting to get a case manager, which I have not always had, but I very recently now have a case manager again after years and years. And um, it's actually been 11 years since I've had a case manager at our insurance company. And it is life-changing having someone like that. Yes, It's a constant battle with the insurance companies. Just to give you one example, um, 
Lily gets IVIG. It's an infusion that boosts her immune system. And she has recently gotten it last week. She was six weeks late. And the reason she was late was because there was a battle between the doctor's office and the insurance company and the prior authorization was not getting received. And I was, it was confirmed with the doctor's office that had been done, but the insurance company wasn't getting it. So the drug couldn't be delivered. And it came down to the case manager making hours of phone calls, which I would have had to do before. And I'd make all these phone calls after three o'clock because I have a full-time job and it would just completely suck up my afternoon. Um, and <clears throat> what we learned was, oh, she takes 15 milligrams and there's an, a prescription for the 10 milligram vial and the five milligram vial. And didn't, you know, we need a prior authorization for both. And they have to be written that way and not for the prescription as a whole. Well, who would know that? I mean, this took weeks for everyone to figure out. And, yeah. you know, it's just things like that, that are extremely challenging for parents. And I don't have any answers for that, but you just have to keep on top of it. It's a daily thing. I mean, there's always phone calls that you have to follow up on and whoever follows up the most wins. I mean, that's what it comes down to. You just have to keep knocking on their door and making sure that they do what they say they're going to do. And um, it's it's just, uh, there, there are no easy answers to that. You just have to keep going. We have... I was going to say, we have, we have two minutes left. Um, so beyond the keeping going and just chipping away at the insurance companies, um, what, is your, what is your most important piece of advice that you would give to those of us who are in the, you know, the life science community and the research community? Um, what would you tell us that you need from our companies and our researchers and to move forward? Um, I think the thing that I spend the most amount of time is educating the community about what is realistic in the time frame that we have with our children. And um, I don't, you know, when I say dialing back the expectations, I don't mean that you shouldn't be, you know, shooting for the stars, but I do mean to dial back your expectations so that you can have a, a happy life with with what you have and you can work on things like symptoms rather than the home run, if that's not available to you for whatever the disease is. I just think that um, there's so much education that needs to happen for families on, you know, what you can do when you're undiagnosed, what you can do when you have a diagnosis that you think might not be right. And what you do when you have a diagnosis that might not be right. You know, how do you keep pursuing and don't stop, don't settle with the diagnosis that you don't think is right. If you don't have the facts, if you don't have the genetic facts, then you don't have the diagnosis and moving forward, you know, you just, I, I used to have my, um, my legal pads split into quadrants and one was for Lily's school and one was for Lily's medical and one was for insurance companies. And then there was one quadrant left for like my world of what I needed to do. But you just have to kind of chip away at each one of those things. And I, I just think you just can't stop. You just have to keep moving. And I think that Lily's success is because of my persistence of making sure that every stone was unturned and that every you know, if you, if you tell me she can't do something, I want to know why. And then I want to know what we can do to make sure she can do it. So you can use that in any example that she had throughout her, throughout her life, but families also have to um, dial back expectations, I think, and not put so much on, um, on where we are today. We're learning. We're, we're all learning about the science and we're, we're trying as much as we can, but we have to move forward in a safe and, you know, a safe way and, um, you know, live for today, but do what you can to, to make sure that tomorrow is a little bit better than today. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you for all of the work that you've done for Lily and for the ADCY5 community. Um, we hope that the conversation with you today has spread a little bit of light and information for our community um, about what not only what you've been going through, but where the work needs to, to head right in the future. Um, so we look forward to continuing the conversation 
Um, we do have our second patient engagement summit that we're doing on April 6th. And I, I'm like, oh my gosh, is it fifth or sixth? I think it's April 6th. Um, it's on our website. So we look forward to engaging with more, um, more people that are just like you, right? That are trying to find answers and are advocating on behalf of the patients that they care for and themselves. Um, so thank you so much for your contributions. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jennifer and Derek. I appreciate the opportunity to, to share information about the disease. And if anybody has any other questions, um, feel free to go to our website and they can email me through there and I will get back to you. That's great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Gay. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.